Well, good morning. And before I get started, I'd like to just uh, go into the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray that the words you would like spoken, please place them on my lips. And the words you would like your people to hear, Lord, please place it on their ears. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, it's interesting. There we go. Let there be light. <clears throat> um, it is interesting in that um, I have done a number of sermons in before. In preparing for this sermon, it's usually when pastor's been gone. So this morning was the first time I think pastor's ever actually been present when I was uh, here, because usually he's on vacation when I sub for him over the past many years. And the fact that I'm still allowed to do it after the first service means I guess it was okay. Plus, I didn't burst into flames or a pillar of salt or anything else, so I didn't say anything that would uh, be sacrilegious. Uh, and the message I want to share today is called The Verse. And it's called The Verse, and it fits very well with the conclusion of our Anchor Sermon series, because this verse can be an anchor for us. And it's an anchor for me, and it can be an anchor for you um, as you really start, you, you think of what we've talked about with the Anchor Sermon Series. There's anchoring in the Spirit, anchoring in our faith, anchoring in God. And this one verse is something that we can anchor into to help us through those storms, and more importantly, something we can help share with others. So, um, as, as Pastor said, we are, our family is moving, um, and what's, what's interesting is I, I thought about this at, at the first uh, service, is I started doing these messages for pastor while he was out a number of years ago, and doing this made me want to get back into teaching, which made me end up get allowing, and, and God f allowed me to, an opportunity at Baylor to teach a class once a week, and now he's allowed in perfect timing for me to begin doing that full-time in January. So Pastor Greg is kind of the reason behind, so to speak, me doing what I'm doing, or at least he, God was using Pastor Greg, giving me this opportunity. So I'm um, very pleased to share this verse as an anchor. And what I want you to think of, if, 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 if I was to ask in an informal poll or formal poll, and ask most Christians, what's the one verse they could use in a, or they could recite from memory? If I gave them one verse, what they would, what do you think the verse would be? John 3.16, that's right. And if you're like me, a sports fan, you remember John 3.16, not what it said, at least as a kid I didn't know what it was, but you remember this image, rainbow head. Rainbow Head was at the Super Bowl. Rainbow Head was at the World Series. Rainbow Head was at the NBA championships. Rainbow Head was there in the end zone or wherever with his rainbow head in John 3, 16. And I really didn't even know what that meant as a kid. And, you know, fast forward here into the, like 2010 or, or so, I don't really remember the years, but another sports figure that did a lot with John 6, 3, 16 was Tim Tebow. So as you can see in the, the eye black, he has John 3.16. And the challenge with this verse, as powerful as it is, if we, and because we know it so much, it can become, we can lose some of the meaning behind it. So I want to unpack this verse to get a little bit deeper, and hopefully by the time we're done, you have a new appreciation for it, and, and most importantly, you have a way to demonstrate and share it to others. That's my goal through, through the day. But before we go through it, what I do want to do is, is take a little bit of a, of, um, before this verse, and get, set the scene of how this comes to be. And if you're familiar with the chosen in verse th or episode three, Jesus is having a private discussion with Nicodemus. Nicodemus is a Pharisee. He's so-called the Pharisee of Pharisee. He's a teacher. In some ways, everything there is to know about the law. And Jesus knows that. Nicodemus knows he's waiting for the Messiah. He is waiting for the Messiah, and he's talking to the Messiah. But he doesn't recognize it. So th that is my favorite episode of The Chosen. So I encourage you to check that out. 
But as, as Jesus and Nicodemus are having a conversation, it does come in, this verse comes into play. So let's read it together. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. So let's unpack this a little bit. <clears throat> so we know this is the verse. We could most recite it even if it wasn't on the slide. But let's dive into each of these phrases and get a different meaning, or a deeper meaning, I should say. So let's start with the first two words. For God. So when you start off with for God, and actually I could probably talk the rest of the time just on these two words. Because there's an assumption here with this, for God. The assumption is there is a God. Logically speaking, there is either a God or there is not. There can be no other, there's either a God, there's not kind of a God. It's either God or no God. So you have to wrestle with that first before we go any further. Is there a God or is there not a God? And I, I would say that there is no greater opposite than those two things on the edge of the spectrum. Because you could say, well, um, the colors black and white are on opposite ends of the spectrum. And they are, but if you were to go to Home Depot to make paint, black paint, you would start with this thing of white paint, and they would drop some dye into it, and it turns into black paint. So they're closer than this. Or you could say life and death. That's two ends of the spectrum. But you really can't have death without life. So God or no God are as far as apart. So if I, if to, to say there's no God, I'm going to move as far as I can and still actually be on camera. I could, as far as I could go, I could actually keep going toward the street. I could keep going even further. No God is over here. God, way over here. And again, it's not even, I, I can't even walk far enough. Of how separate these two are and how both require faith. I'll come back to this part in a moment, the for God. Let's, just, let's talk for a minute. There's no God. Remember, there's only two alternatives, God or no God. There's, there cannot be an in-between. So for the no God, the people that have faith in that, because it, faith is believing what you can't see. So if you have the faith that there's no God, here's some of the things that you have to believe without seeing. You have to be anti-physics because matter has to create matter. Somehow, the existence of elements, matter, somehow have to create themselves out of nothing to then create something to in order to have a big bang that then in turn creates a solar system and galaxies out of nothing. So you, you have to agree that that's your first faith step. Then you have to, um, the big bang occurs and there has to be a planet that is in an orbit around a heat source, the sun, that's just far enough away to sustain life, and that planet has to be just in the right orbit and just on the right axis to be able to not spin out of, of some elliptical orbit. That all has to happen on accident. That takes faith. That takes a great deal of faith that you to believe in that. So let's not call it anti-faith. That's, <clears throat> if you believe that, that takes just as much faith as faith in God. Then, if you believe in macroevolution, what you have to believe also is that species or go from a single-cell organism, they mutate in a beneficial manner simultaneously with things all at the same time, meaning optical nerves, sense of smell, circulatory systems, skeletal systems, digestive systems, immunity systems, cardio systems. All these things have to mutate at the exact same time in order to create from a single cell to us. So if you believe that accidentally happened over time in mutation, you kind of have to be anti-statistics. <laughs> Because what you have to believe visually, what you would have to do is if, if you, had, if you uh, had a plant building, 
you have to, that plant through a series of, of, of supply where let's say the, there's abnormalities in the parts that build the bicycle, that at some point in time, that bicycle come out pours a 747 jumbo jet. All those things have to mutate to create that jumbo jet. That's what you have to believe in this side of the equation. That's anti-statistics. It's really anti-science if you really start thinking about the... the uh, the, the, the microbiology, that's what you have to believe. So that takes faith. So I'm going to cross this off the discussion for right now and I'm going to focus on and continue to focus on for God. So there is a God. So if there is a God, you're like, uh-oh. Now there's a God that spoke the universe into existence. There's a God that, in his word, created our world. He told the mountains how high they should be. He told the waters where they needed to stop, how deep they should be. He knows Mount Everest is 29,000 feet tall because he told it to be 29,000 feet tall. Okay? Okay? But there's some that believe that God is kind of, well, all right, there's a God, but he just kind of said it and forget it. You know, he's, um, that was, in fact, popular in the early part of our country. It was Deus, that God created the stuff, set it in motion, and it's no longer, he's not really active or involved. And an analogy of that would be, um, as a kid, my 10th birthday, I couldn't wait to get the tabletop electric football. There's a tabletop electric football. It was a football field made of metal, and you had these, you had players, individual players, and there were, you know, 11 on each side, and you would line them up, and you, you could dial these little things underneath, and there was a quarterback, but your quarterback, you could never actually complete a pass. That was really dumb. It was a running game, and you would flip a switch, and the bottom of the board would vibrate. Now, the, remember, Kids, this is before video games, okay? So this is what we had to entertain ourselves. You click the button, and the, the, the bottom would vibrate, and the, the players would just go, and they would, one would just twirl around and do nothing over on the sideline, and a few others would actually do something, and they would block, and that was fun. Now you wonder why we were so excited when Pong came out. You're like, wow, that's Pong, as you can do stuff. So that's what, that, that is not the God that is the creator of the universe. That is not the set it and forget it God. No, the God of the universe that told us Mount Everest should be 29,000 feet tall also knows the hairs on our head, which is around 100,000, give or take. He knows us that well. He knew us in our mother's womb. He wants to be an active participant in our life and wants us to cling to him. So instead of a, a video game going, not a video, but, you know, a tabletop game, what he wants to be is a video game that we're actively involved in because he's got the cheat codes in his Bible. And if you, if you start reading the cheat codes for your life, he's not only going to be in your head as you're playing the life video game, He's going to give you words to help you, instructions. He's also going to want to help with the controller. In fact, if you trust him enough, you could give him the controller and let him play. That is a God who wants to be actively involved with us, not a set it and forget it God. So that is for God. Next, so loved. God exemplifies unconditional love. So that God that knows how tall Mount Everest is, knows how many hairs are on our head, and he values us. We are the crown jewel of his creation. He wants to have a relationship with us. And his love is unconditional for us. So how would I describe unconditional love? How would I explain and visualize it? Um, my best example of that... Oh, I'll, well, I'll, I'll share conditional love. <clears throat> so, as many of you know, 
uh, my wife Dana uh, and I, we've been married 32 years, 30 of them happily. She told me I could say that joke, by the way. So, um, 32 happily. But our, our love is conditional. And you're like, well, that's not right. Well, first and foremost, I, there was a point in time where I didn't know Dana. We met in college. We, we got to know each other. She agreed to go on a date with me, so that was conditional. She had to say yes, but it was for ice cream, so how do you not say yes? It's the second date that was probably actually more important. <clears throat> so she said yes to the second one, and then we gradually got to know each other more, and then we, I don't know, fell in love. Our, our love developed but that love was conditional because she had to say yes when I asked her to marry her. That if she said no, I don't know. I, well, who knows? Uh, I would have stalked her. No, I, I would at some point in time. Uh, there would be a point in time that that was conditional. And we can say as much as we want that marriage is, not, is unconditional love. Let's face it. We are all selfish individuals that somehow come together, and it is a miracle of marriage that that can actually happen. And the goal is to be unconditional. But in most ways, it's still somewhat conditional. So we are striving for unconditional love. It's a goal. Being married about three years, we, um, our, our oldest son, Evan, was born. And he came out, and we loved him unconditionally despite him doing nothing. In fact, he made Dana's life miserable. She had morning sickness. She had ankle swelling. She had cramps, heartburn. Then comes delivery. Woo. But at, despite all that pain, despite that nine months of, oh, this is terrible, that child comes out the child's done nothing but cause pain and discomfort, and suddenly, wow, we love this child. Oh my goodness, look at this thing. It's all gooey. We still love it, even though it's goony, because they do clean it up, and it's, it's actually all cute after that. And you love the child. And that first year, all that child is really doing is eating, drinking, pooping, barfing, and farting a lot, which very much sounds like my first year of college. But the child does nothing to deserve love, but you love it unconditionally. And as that child grows, you do start getting some things in return. They, they are sweet, and they write thank you notes, or they do certain things on Mother's Day or Christmas. They give you cute gifts or whatever it happens to be. They start doing things, but you don't love them more because of that. You just are getting some, some things in return. Then they turn into teenagers. Oh, now... They don't want to be around you because you're not cool. They don't want to be part of you. They want you to let them off at school far enough away that nobody can actually see you at the school. They don't value your word because they may value the word of their friends more. They are not thankful. They do not appreciate the things you do for them. They do mean things back to you a whole lot of time. Can I get some amens from parents of teenagers right now? Okay, get some amens, but remember, parents of teenagers, you were the same way. So it, what comes around goes around. But those teenage children do the exact thing to us as parents as we do to God. We take his blessings for granted. He's not cool. God's not cool. God creates a bunch of rules to keep us from having fun. We know better. This is, that's always a good one you hear. Is, we know better. But God still loves us, despite that, unconditionally. It doesn't matter what we do. He still loves us. And what's great is, is your children do get older and they become um, adults. Actually, a little around college time, they start to appreciate you. So get ready, parent. That'll happen someday. It'll happen. And, and they want to spend time with you. You're no longer uncool. Well, okay, maybe less uncool. But now they come to you for wisdom because you've, you've, you've applied for a mortgage before. Whoa. 
You, you have things and skills that, that they want, they value, and they want to become and be closer to you and, and seek guidance and seek more part of your life. And they appreciate you a whole lot more. That is what happens to us with God when we understand where we shouldn't be teenagers with him. We understand that God so loved the world that he knows Mount Everest is this tall and he knows the banana hair on our head. When we understand that, we want to be closer to him and be in his word and show him appreciation. That is the reaction of knowing these things and knowing this verse. So, so loved. Next. The world. This one's pretty easy. Think of any type thing in the news today. Think of whatever country happens to be in the news that somehow, at least in our country's perspective, you would think of, okay, North Korea, Russia, Afghanistan, all these places that somehow we think there's some issue back towards our country. They're included in that, the world. I actually don't know of a place on the planet that's not included, because it says the world. So it's, it's all of it. In fact, it's not just the places, it's the stuff of the world. Because when God made the world, when he made the trees, when he made the lakes, when he made all the various things, he came around and said, hey, that's good. And when we, he creates the new earth, he's really going to create the old earth is it's one and the same. It's, he created it and it was good. So we know the world is good. He created it. Next. That he gave. This is important, especially now at Christmas time, because you always hear it's better to give and to receive. Yeah, it depends, who you're, <laughs> it depends what kind you're going to get for a gift. Um, and this gift we're going to talk about, it's better to receive. Because if you give a gift, there's, there's a second part of that process. There's the receiving. So if I go to Amazon and buy something for you and send it to your house, if you moved and it's still sitting on your front porch... You never get the gift. You, didn't, you weren't there to receive it. Or you never open your front door. It's still going to sit there. You didn't, I gave it to you, but you did not receive it or take possession of it. You didn't get a chance to really receive the gift. So gift giving does require receiving. And the part that as God gave, what he gave is his son to die for us, which is going to be coming up in a moment. And I think the best analogy I can give from the importance of what he gave is using uh, an analogy of a presidential pardon. So the president of the United States has the ability to pardon whoever the president wants to for whatever reason. The, that's the authority given to the president of the United States. Whether you voted for the individual or not, that person, the president, has the ability. So you could be convicted of some crime and you're in jail and the president hears about your situation for whatever reason and writes a pardon and that's delivered to the, the prison and you read it and you go, thank you, Mr. President. I, I appreciate your pardon. I accept it. You walk out. You're done. You accepted the pardon. Or you get that presidential pardon. You could say, Mr. President, I didn't vote for you. I don't think you should be president. Um, I don't like you. All the different things you could say about, I don't really need you. I can do this on my own. If you don't accept the pardon, you stay in jail. The president has the ability to pardon you. You did not accept the pardon. You stay convicted. That's the same thing here. God is giving us this gift that's going to follow here in just a moment. We have to receive it. So what, and, and we'll come to what that means in receiving it in just a moment. Next, please. What did he give us? 
He gave us his one and only son, Jesus. So while we are all children of God, we are all sons and daughters of God, we are heirs to his kingdom, we are not God. We are not begotten. And what does that mean, begotten? We were created, created in God's image, but we are not God. So if I'm an artist, clump of clay, and I form it into a human being, it may have the image of a human being, but it's not a human being. It's a clump of clay that looks like a human being. If I happen to, with my wife, create a child... We have, in essence, begotten a child because now that child is, is equal parts of us and has the characteristics and the, as far as a being perspective, has equal properties to what we have. So while we are sons and daughters of God, we were created out of clay. To be in his image, Jesus was with God before creation. He was begotten, not made, which in other words means when Jesus was here in the nativity, in the manger, he was equal to an equal in every way to God despite being this form of this baby, despite this human form. He's always been part of God before creation. He is God. That's a big distinction because the fact that he's begotten, made, he's not just a good teacher. He's not just got some good sayings that we should follow. He is God. And why that's important, because he is God, we are not. And that's a struggle that I know a lot of people have, because I hear this a lot. If God is God, or let me rephrase that. I don't believe in a God that could do this, fill in the blank. I don't believe God would do that, fill in the blank. Because what we do in that situation, we think we are gods. And God should be made in our image versus us being made in his. And I think God looks at that and laughs. Because God looks back and says, wait a minute, I, I created Mount Everest to be this tall. I created you. You all can't even figure out how to use roundabouts. No, you just go stop. You all can't figure out spatial spaces. You go on airplanes and try to jam these big bags into the carry-on that has no way it's ever going to fit into the thing. You can't figure that out. I created mountains. I curated the depths of the oceans. I created a duckbill platypus. I don't even know what that is, but I created it nonetheless. We, we don't have game. We are created in his image, not... So the important part of this is let God be God and let us be his creation. So what did he give us? His one and only son. So that, next one, <laughs> whoever, all right, there's the audience participation. I want you to all think of a name in your mind. Think of a name that is the person that's hurt you the most, the person that's the meanest person to you, that's done you the most harm, that's undeserving of anything. Just don't say it out loud because they could be in the room. Especially if they're next to you. Don't do that. So whoever that person is, think about it for a minute. Okay, you got that name. Hopefully it didn't come quickly. Do they qualify under the whoever? Is there anybody that doesn't qualify under the whoever? I haven't found a person yet. Whoever means everybody. Everybody. There's not a qualifier for whoever. So everyone is given this gift. We need to remember that. And importantly, we 
when we're given. Sometimes we don't feel that we deserve the gift. We feel that if, if we come into this place or even think about coming into a church, we're going to burst into flames. No. We get this gift too. We qualify under whoever. Next. Believes in him. We actually went through this just a moment ago with communion. We did a confession. We all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We need confession. We need to understand that we are in need of a pardon. And Jesus is that pardon, is that person that writes the, the ransom. He pays the bail. He pays what's due, whatever you want to call it. That is believing in him. The demons believe that Jesus existed and had power and authority. They did believe that they needed redemption. So people can believe Jesus existed, but the part of believing in him, in Jesus, requires the understanding that we need his pardon, that we are sinners and can't get to a final relationship God without going through Jesus. That is believing the need and accepting the pardon. Next, please. Shall not perish. This is a hard one because except for two people in the Bible that I'm aware of, everyone has perished. I think Enoch was no more. I was just, huh? Enoch's there. He's gone. Where, where did Enoch go? I don't know. He's with God. Who knows? Elisha. At least people saw Elisha go up into a whirlwind. Who? Elisha's gone. Did, both did not die. Everybody else died. Lazarus died twice. Some of the other people that were brought back to the dead still died. So, statistically speaking, the odds are not great that we're not going to physically die. These perishable bodies that we reside in are going to die. But the perishable is going to be imperishable. We'll talk a moment about what that means in a second. So these bodies that we're walking around in are going to die. So how do we deal with it? How do we live knowing that? Well, we're going to live for the promise that comes next, but we're not there yet. My son, Keith, while he was at the University of Arkansas, was part of uh, Campus Crusade for Christ. And that organ, the group of students, they would try to mentor other students and bring the gospel to, to other students. And one of the techniques they learned in some of their leadership classes is, is this, this simple question. If, if you were to die today on a scale of 0 to 100, what would you say is, are you assured of being in heaven, being with Jesus? It's a good question. It's a good thought starter. Keith asked me that, and I said 100. Actually, can I go above 100? He says, no, you can't go above 100. I asked John Elvis that earlier. I said, John, you can't go to 120. 100 is as high as you can go. But it begins the question, because some people, they're not sure. And you don't... We'll get to how you can be sure in, in a moment. But it's, it's interesting, because Keith asked that question to his older brother, Evan. And if you don't know Evan's story, Evan was battling cancer for four years. And this past summer, it became very clear that the cancer was taking over. So Keith asked his brother, Evan, when on a scale of 1 to 100, where would you be? Evan said 80. Like, 80? I'll take 80 at that point. Because where it may have been earlier probably wasn't that high. And then, Evan passed in October. The day he passed, what he told us is he felt amazing. And we asked him, Evan, why do you feel amazing? And he said, I'm with Jesus. And it feels amazing. When you are with Jesus and still on the earth, you can go above 100. He was at 110. 
And I tell you that story to tell you this story. My mother passed away a month later. My mother watched Evan's funeral celebration, and I'll call it a celebration, and I thank for everyone involved and, and so many of you that were here that we celebrated that amazing story. My mom was too sick to travel. She watched it online, and she didn't know this, Evan's final story. And my mom was 84 years old and afraid to die, she was, and which caused her to be afraid to live. If you asked her on that scale, she probably would have been a 60 or 70. Because somewhere in my mom's thought, who, where it was whoever believes in him, she thought there was also and does enough stuff. Whoever believes in him and does enough stuff, and she didn't know if she had done enough stuff. And what we try to say is, does enough stuff is not in any of the translations. There is not a believes in Jesus and does enough stuff. So my mom learned how to perish at 84 years from her 28-year-old grandson because he was at or above 100% on that scale. What is the scale? It's the next slide. Shall not perish but have eternal life. And that will be amazing. That's what we want to share. Because what we want to share is God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not die but have eternal life. And that's amazing. So I ask you to ask yourself, what score, scale are you? What's on your scale? Now, get to 100 on our own. That's not something we we necessarily, we give credit to the Holy Spirit getting us to 100. But it's taking that verse and letting that verse be an anchor. And when that verse becomes an anchor for you, it becomes a lifeline to others. So what I ask of you today is where are you on that scale? If you're 100, praise God that the Spirit is alive in you. And let's share this verse as a lifeline to others. If you're at 50 to 90s, what I'd ask that you do is, is seek out some of the classes. We have the Next Level Discipleship class that, that John Elvis leads. And, and John is a strength and conditioning coach to help get from 50 to 100. Um, because you start bringing and you, it, it brings the word and you want to absorb and bring more of that word into your life. So that becomes a lifeline to others. You can share that lifeline. If, if you're at zero to, to 50, what I'd ask that you do is we, we'll, we have people that corner after each service that would love to pray with you, for you, and over you to help you answer some of those questions. What does it take to get from 10 to 90 or get how do I get how do I start the process it doesn't just happen there's things we need to do the, the doing those things doesn't get us to heaven doing those things is a reaction of what we want to do to find and absorb that love of God that we when we absorb it when it's our anchor, is a lifeline to others. So let us close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for loving us, for creating this world, for giving the gift of your Son that whoever believes in him who understands they need pardoning, understand that Jesus died for them, will not die but have eternal life, Lord. Lord, we pray that we, we, we understand, we grasp this verse in a way that we can now share it with others. In Jesus' name I pray.